the number is uh, going to be closer to 1.5 billion who live under those conditions. Uh, the, the math here is wrong. Uh, it's a mess. It's a massive number of people. Um, let's take a look at these bar charts. Um, it's we do we know how many people in the world are LGBT? I, I think we don't. Uh, <coughs> the estimates range from one percent. Uh, some uh, studies in Western countries have shown that the numbers are higher than 10%. Uh, but for purposes of this exercise, I've assumed that a minimum, a minimum of 1% of the world's population is LGBT. It's a fairly small, <coughs> fairly small, cons very conservative estimate. And in this, in this little chart, uh, what we try to do is examine why so few LGBTs are coming out at the other end of the world of the international refugee system. Why there are so many LGBTs who end up surviving, coming through uh, the UN High Commission Ref for Refugee System, the National Asylum System, coming out of the, at the other end. Um, so let's run through the numbers. If we assume that there are 700,000 LGBTs who are self-defined or conscious of their own sexual orientation or gender identity, right? That's 1% of the total world population who are LGBT, according to statistics. Uh, if we assume 700,000 are self-defined or conscious in some way or another, um, and we assume that only 10% of those are self-announced or denounced by others, we end up with 70,000 um, 70, people. Out of those, many of those that were living in the countries that I was describing to you where you can be arrested, killed, beaten up, uh, we assume that 50,000 uh, will eventually be um, targeted. We'll assume that another 15,000 are physically and financially able to flee. Because as I was describing before, most cannot afford to flee, um, either, either because they are so traumatized psychologically, psychiatrically, um, traumatized educationally, traumatized financially, that they just don't, that it's beyond their, their um, imagination that they can flee to another country. Um, we'll assume that out of those, 10% are aware that refugee protection is available to LGBTs at all, and let me tell you that that's, a, that's an, an exaggeration. Most LGBTs around the world don't have any idea that they're entitled to refugee protection. Um, we'll assume that out of those, 1,000 are able to access international protection, and we're talking about countries of transit now, um, and then let's assume that about half of those are legally recognized as refugees. That leaves you with 500 people worldwide. Um, and then let's assume very generously that out of those, 200 get resettled somewhere. And that's actually also very, very generous. Um, and this is how you get to an end result where a U.S. system which, is, which resettled uh, over 60,000 people last year resettled fewer than 200 openly LGBT people. They just cannot get through the system. By the time the system wears you down and beats you down enough, you get to a place where there's almost no one left. And this is the reason where if you know you're LGBT, what you're going to do is you're going to save your pennies. Now, you probably don't have a visa, and that means you can't very well go to a, an Australian consulate or a U.S. consulate and explain to the consul why it is that you're going to go back home after you're done visiting that country. If you don't have an education, and you're not married, and you don't have children, and you don't have property, you can't get a visa in the first place to get into one of those countries, so you're just never going to get in there. Um, you will either travel clandestinely without documentation and come in overland, and again, that's a large part of the phenomenon that we see here in the United States, um, or you just um, won't go at all. And the vast majority of LGBTs will just stay home uh, where they'll live lives of desperation or die in desperation. That's the reality that we're dealing with. Carol, can you keep track of time for me, please? You have a timekeeper right in the front. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> so, um, what is a refugee? I don't want to assume that everybody knows. Um, it's um, someone who is outside their country of origin, who has a well-founded fear of persecution based on race, religion, nationality, political opinion, or membership in a particular social group. Um, this is based on the 1951 Refugee Convention, which has been imported into U.S. law. Um, sexual orientation is, uh, uh, and gender identity are not enumerated per se 
in the Refugee in the 1951 Geneva Convention or in U.S. law, but it's now uh, fairly well accepted internationally that these categories constitute uh, membership of a social group, of a particular social group. This is not without its problems, and you'll be hearing about the problems that come, come from the, uh, these human-made definitions to a non-human-made <coughs> phenomenon called sexual orientation and gender identity. Um, a particular social group means a group of people who share the same characteristic, which distinguishes them from society at large. Share some characteristic, which distinguishes them from uh, society at large. Their characteristic has to be unchangeable, either because it's innate, or otherwise impossible to change because it would be wrong to require an individual to change that. Now, these, are, these are pretty tough words. What's innate? How many people in this room have seen proof that sexual orientation is innate? I've seen a lot of evidence, I've never seen any conclusive evidence. If you, if you know of it, please speak up. Um, here in this room, sitting in San Francisco, I think most of you would probably agree that one's sexual orientation or gender identity is so fundamental to your character that it would be wrong to require you to change it. That's here in San Francisco. That may not be true in some other places, even in California, and it is definitely not true in many, many countries around the world. So we're dealing, again, we're dealing with legal definitions that are informed by cultural definitions and by cultural mores. Um, um, and although the convention would call for an international standard that would be applied the same everywhere, that's in fact not the case. So we're dealing with these, uh, with these cultural understandings both on the part of adjudicators, on the part of lawmakers, and on the part of the refugees themselves. And we'll get to that in a little bit. Um, in terms of how uh, the LGBTs fit into the social group category, which is the vast majority of the claims, uh, lesbians, of course, share the immutable characteristic of being sexually or emotionally attracted to women, gay men, the same um, for men. Uh, these characteristics, at least here in the United States, are regarded as fundamental um, and um, largely immutable. Bisexuals, more of a problem. Is bisexuality immutable? You tell me. Um, can, is somewhat the fact of someone's being bisexual, is probably not immutable, but bisexuals oftentimes spend periods being attracted to one sex or another, um, and are, and oftentimes find it very easy to hide behind their bisexuality uh, so that they're not defined as a member of, of the, um, the persecuted social group of gays or lesbians. Uh, there have been, the case law has been all over the place about bisexuals, about whether they, they are qualified as refugees. Uh, transgender, uh, probably the easiest kind of case to prove um, because transgenders are so, uh, are so marginalized in society and so excluded and uh, picked upon and traumatized. But uh, I have to tell you that we haven't even won all of our transgender cases. There have been uh, several transgender cases that have been denied, uh, sometimes because uh, adjudicators outside the US haven't understood what transgender is, or haven't believed the client, or uh, a related reason. 